Well, Mickey's big hand is on the six, guys, so we got to get going. Um, my name is Dana. I'm the circulation librarian here at Rogers Memorial Library. I am an avid gardener, an avid outdoors person in general, and I've got the itch. And if you guys are here, you've got the itch too. This warm weather is like peaking everybody right now. So what this is about is how to prepare for the spring fall planting. Now I know people that are out there right now because of this warm weather sticking stuff in the ground. And if anything I've ever learned about all my years of my 60 some odd years of living in New England is don't do it because we could have four feet of snow tomorrow. You don't know. When I got home from the armory, the first, the first thing I did is I pulled up, I had a 69 Mustang and I pulled it out of my parents' garage down here on Haverhill, they lived down on Haverhill Street. So I grew up in Hudson. And so I get out of the army, first thing I do is put the wheels back on the Mustang, bring it down off the jacks, back it out, wash and wax it. Mom's got pictures of this, or had pictures of it. The next day, there was two feet of snow on top of the car. I had just taken it out of storage, washed and waxed it, and there was two feet of snow. So, don't take anything for granted around here. First day of fishing season for trout is April 1st. We had a beautiful spring. My wife, my then fiance, now wife, bought, bought me a brand new fishing rod. Beautiful. Had it in the truck. I was going from Hudson here up. Uh, I was going to fish further north, and I was on 93. Sudden snowstorm. I got into an automobile accident. The fishing rod it was like in like nine million little pieces when it got through with it. Don't take anything for granted. When do we? When do we usually plant around here? Memorial Day. Memorial Day is, is a good thing. Now, anybody who knows me, there's a couple in here that do, know that I'm not really big on following rules, and I push the envelope a little bit. So I will be probably in April sometime planting and pushing that envelope. But we'll see what happens. But I'm not encouraging you guys to do that because soil that's too wet, soil that's is just as bad as soil that's too dry. And right now, even without snow, we've had so much rain that the, the ground is so saturated, you really can't work it correctly. So you do have to wait. Resist the urge, but start thinking about it now. So preparing for spring planting. You have to ask yourself, what do you want to do? That's the very first question. What do you want to do? Do you want to have this garden to feed your family and friends and everything else? Is it for your own entertainment? Is it for aesthetics? Is it going to be vegetables? Is it going to be flowers? Is it going to be a combination of all the above? You got to understand what you want because whether this is your first garden or you, or you garden every year, gardens are a lot of work. It's not easy to grow. Now, when you t most people think of gardening is you get some dirt, you get some seeds you, or a plant, you stick it in the ground, you add some water, and there it is. Well, by strict definition, yeah, probably it's pretty much what it is. But to be successful, there's other things that you need to do to make that work. So these are the things that you have to understand. If you want to grow roses, if roses are your thing, 
there's a different things that you need to do than is if you're planting squash. Or if blueberries, if you want tons of blueberry bushes, blueberries are a different ball game altogether. There's things that you need to do for like blueberries. So you need, the very first question you have to ask yourself is what do I want to do? The next question is, and I'm gonna go down to number three, is how much room do you have? Do you have a couple acres? Do you have an acre? Do you have a house lot where you have like, you can have like a 20 by 20 garden? Do you live in a condominium complex or a housing complex or, or someplace where they restrict you on what you can do with the yard? So you have to grow things in pots? How much room do you have to work with? And be honest with yourself. Because the amount of room that you have to work with will go to the question I put at number two is what do you want to plant? A flower bed works great in short boxes. You can do boxes of flowers. You can do boxes of herbs. You can do boxes of greens. You can do boxes of a lot of things. Tomato plants do well in, a lot of tomato plants do well in pots. But if you have a, the place in a yard to do like a 20 by 20 or a 20 by 40 garden, that opens your opportunities to grow other things. Things like cucumbers, squashes. They are pumpkins, which are in the squash family, but they are all, they send out runners. They take up a lot of space unless you train them to grow straight up which would be on a trellis. So beans, peas, they take room. So space is a big thing. If you want to grow corn, you better have a whole heck of a lot of land to do it on. Because corn takes up a lot of, lot of room. Now, I don't grow corn because it, it, it does take up too much space and it, it is too much work. And it's one of those things is one little thing goes wrong and the whole thing goes wrong. A lot of people who grow corn, if you, you notice, like if you live down here, you go down the Litchfield Road or any place else, you see the rows of cornfields and that's what they're growing is that it's, it's, it's a monocultural crop. That's where they're, all their money is made in that corn. So I, you know, I prefer planting multiple things at one time. But you need to decide, one, what do you want to do? Two, what you want to plant? And three, how much room you have? Why is it important to do this? I mean, I've kind of like highlighted it, but when you're looking at what you want to do, why do you think it's important? I'll give you a hint. It costs money to garden. Why does it cost money to garden? It's just seeds, dirt, and water, right? If you use fertilizer, yes. If you use commercial fertilizers, which I do not, yes, it does cost. But even if you don't, if you're using um, compost, if you don't make your own compost, you're buying bags of compost. Or you're buying fresh compost, which you shouldn't be using fresh compost because it'll burn your plants, but stuff that's aged, you go into a local farm, whether it be horse manure, cow manure, or whatever, and you're, and you're trucking it in, that costs money. So no matter how you do it, whether you go to Lowe's or Home Depot and grab it by the 20 pound bag or 40 pound bag or whatever it comes in, or you have it trucked in, or you go buy the bags of miracle Grow or whatever the fertilizer is that you put in your garden, it costs money. 
it takes time and effort and money to make your garden grow. If you are just starting out and you're looking at that, and, and you guys and women, that you, your spouses have to be on board with this thing because I made the mistake of turning my entire backyard into a garden. The couch is not that comfortable over a long period of time. So I ended up planting grass a little bit in to, to, to make it a little bit smaller. But if you're breaking through sod, you're gonna, it, that's backbreaking work. If you're using it, I did it with a shovel. Not anymore, I've got a tiller. But even that, it, it's a lot of work. You gotta till it out. And then you, and then you have the, New Hampshire's top crop, which is rocks. They go, I got the best stone wall. That's right. Room. Right. You know, and you're going to continue to get stones because no matter how much you turn that soil, they keep coming back. You think you got them all? Oh, no. They keep coming back. That's why they're the number one crop in New Hampshire. But you've got to turn that soil. You've got to rake that soil out. You've got to get those, all the, the that weed material, that grass out. Then you've got to add your your compost or whatever to enrich your soil. Because another thing that New Hampshire is famous for is its acidic soil. We have a lot of pine trees. <coughs> pine trees love acidic soil. That tells you a lot about our, our, our area. Now I work into my soil. I have gotten my garden to the point where I don't have to till it every year. Like every other year, I'll till it, till it once in the spring, and then I won't till it again. And I just rake it out. But it took me a, over 30 years to get it to that point. That's adding leaf material. It's adding compost that I've saved myself. It's, added, it's adding store-bought manure. It's adding everything I can think of other than commercial fertilizers into that soil. And eventually it, it takes care of itself. But you still need to take care of it. You need the work. So if you're using a tiller, I use an electric tiller, but if you have a gas-powered tiller, you're buying fuel. So you time, money, labor into this. So that is why it's important you know what you want to do before you even start. So if you're looking at this thing and you say, all right, he told me those three questions. What do I need to do? Make a plan. <clears throat> you have to make a plan. Because even us that have been having a garden for a long time, we get overexcited. Especially when it's warm like this. We get over antsy. And you pick up that package of seeds and those seeds are only this big. I can put a whole crap load of those in that garden, right? They're only this big. No. You read the directions on the seed packet. Because they do get big and they do take room. That's why they tell you to thin them out and give them space. So you've got a 20 by 20, 20 by 40 garden. Let's just say that just for, for something to work with. And you're sitting there going, oh, well, mm, I got a whole lot of room there. So you either go to the, the local garden center or you buy a package of seeds or you buy plants and you say, well, these plants are only this big. I can fit a bunch in there. Come June, it'll look like a jungle in there. You won't be even be able to move. Or you'll choke themselves out because you've, you've, you, hasn't, you haven't given them enough room. Or you mixed a squash plant in with near, too close to your tomato plants. Has anybody ever seen what squash plants do? They send out runners. Think of it like a, they look like an octopus, right? And they send out these runners, and as soon as they hit a stick, a Anything up above it, a cage for your tomatoes, they start climbing. 
which is cool until they pull down your tomato cage with all your tomatoes on it. So you, you got to do your proper spacing and things. So that's part of your plan. So I'm going to erase this over here and I'm going to give you an idea on how I set this thing up. Now, I've already drawn this plan out. I haven't even roped it off, pegged it off, or anything else. But this is what I base my, my idea on. And I, I also, my garden is like a 20 by 40. That's what my wife allowed me to do. So, so it's a 20, 40. So this is basically what I'm doing. Every year I, I rotate the, the way the crops go in. I either go vertically or horizontally. And what I plant depends on what it is. So like say last year I planted my tomatoes, we went horizontally and I planted them right here. I will now plant them way up here in this corner down this way. I move everything around. Can anybody tell me why? This, comes, this goes into the planning stage. Because some, okay, I'll tell you, the, there are some plants that will transmit diseases into the soil. Tomatoes should not be planted by potatoes. So I rotate everything out. If I plant potatoes on any, say I plant, I'm not planting potatoes this year, but just let's, for just giggles, let's say I am. I am not going to plant them this right here because that's where tomatoes were last year. There could be microorganisms in there, diseases that come with potatoes that could affect tomato plants. So this is part of that planning stage figuring out what you want to do, where you want to do it. So if I'm going to plant, say I'm going to plant on the horizontal, I divide my garden into, into two with a walking space right there. Usually throw bark mulch or something down there to keep the weeds down. So then I'll do something You know, on something, like, something skinny like this, I'll do like radishes in there because radishes aren't, they, they grow the quickest and you get rid of them. You harvest them the soonest. You can just re keep replanting them. But on the back of the package, squash take up more room. So what I divide that 40, that 20 foot space in by 40, it'll be like a, It'll be like a one, there's a one foot, and then a one foot break between each one of the things. When I do squash, because they take up a lot of space, I'll do two, a two foot row. Tomatoes, I'll do the same thing, I'll do a two foot row. Because what I'll do with tomatoes is I'll go boom, boom, boom and all the way down the road. That way I can reach in around them all. And then I'll, I'll have a break here, and I'll have something else growing in there. That's, but that's, just a rough, that's how I do a rough idea. Depending on how much space is needed, beans and peas don't need a lot of space because they grow straight up. You just put a trellis in them and put the seeds on both sides and they grow up both sides. Or you can use the teepee style type of trellis. If anybody ever seen those? Or you can plant like my ancestors did, 
they planted the three sisters together, the beans, the corn, and, and, the, and the squash. And where you put, if you, if you had the room, say those are all corn plants. Because you need at least three rows of corn spaced about a foot apart so they can pollinate each other. Other than that, you're not going to get anything. But at the base, as soon as that squash, that, that corn plant breaks the soil, it's about yay big, plant beans in there, pole beans, beans that climb. As the corn grows, the beans will grow up with it. And that corn stalk now becomes the trellis for those beans. Then you plant squash seeds or pumpkin all the way around that. And the, the leaves of the squash and the pumpkin are these big, huge things which block out weed growth underneath, underneath those. It helps. It does, it's not foolproof. I, I've never seen, no matter what you do, you can't fool weeds. They will, they will come up somehow. They come up in concrete. You think you're going to stop them from coming up in your garden that you fertilized? <laughs> no. So, but it helps. But what the native people figured out was that corn, which is grass on steroids, it's part of the same family as, as grass, sucks nitrogen. Because if you notice, if you, if you have these nice green lawns, the fertilizer you're putting on them is almost, is majority of the chemical in there is nitrogen. That's what makes the, the grass grow and turn green. So corn sucks nitrogen right out of the soil. But beans, peas, and other legumes, legumes like soybeans and things, put nitrogen back in the soil. So the beans act as a feeding source for that corn. Growing the beans as a feeding source? Yeah, when you grow the beans, even, even if I don't plant corn, and right here and right here, at the end of the growing season, it's going to be full of nitrogen because the bean plants put the nitrogen right back into the soil, which would help when I do the other way. It'll help the, the whole growing system because I keep rotating all the crops. So that's what making a plan is all about. You have to, you have to know those, those things that you want to do. You've got to know this. You've got to make the plan. You've got to, now is the perfect time to buy whatever you need to buy. If you need to buy any type of tools and things of that nature, now is the time to buy it. Because if you wait till April, you're going to be paying out the nose. Just figure out what you need, yeah. Do you plant like mint or anything around your plants for pest control? I plant, what I plant is marigolds a lot. But what I'm finding is most of the pesty animals, like the rabbits, the woodchucks, the deer, they don't read the same books that I do that says that marigolds are supposed to drive them off. Because, but because sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But yeah, I do, I like to, and what I've started doing lately is intermixing flowers in with my vegetables because it attracts pollinators. So you get the best of both worlds. Do you use ladybugs? I saw something like that. I've never really had them. I don't put bugs anywhere. Okay. Bugs happen where bugs happen. But ladybugs are great because they, they eat the aphids. They're, they're, if you're a rose grower, you want ladybugs around because they'll eat those aphids even though they, next thing you know, that you got them all in the, the doorway of your house and stuff, but, but they do help. Some of those, you know, those insects help. Yeah, I don't spray my, any of my gardens with anything. I don't spray it. I don't use commercial fertilizers because you end up eating that stuff. And I, don't, I just don't like using them. But I, I know people that do, fine, whatever. How many of you are getting seed catalogs? 
You haven't gotten to your seed catalogs yet? You're not going to get them now this year. They, they usually get there about January, February, and they try to sell you every ding-dong hybrid plant that there ever was. A lot of people say, what do I plant? I plant what we eat. I plant what my family eats. That's what I'm, who I'm growing this stuff for. Is I'm growing it to feed my, my family. So you, you plant what they eat. I personally cannot stand eggplant. You will never see me growing eggplant. I just can't deal with it. Other people, if eggplant's your thing, then eggplant's your thing, okay? No big deal. But you plant what you're going to grow because, again, it's a lot of work making this happen. So don't bust your butt out there doing this, even though it's fun, it's relaxing, it's all this stuff. It's nothing like getting your hands dirty. It's really great. It's therapeutic. But it's work. And it's nothing worse than butt, busting your butt for something you don't want. So if you don't like eggplant, don't plant eggplant. So plant, and that's where it says, what do you want to plant? Plant what your family's going to eat, or if, if that's what your intention is. My daughter plants blueberry bushes. She goes nuts for blueberry bushes and raspberry bushes. They like acid. So we have the perfect soil for blueberry bushes. Blueberries, raspberries, lilacs, rhododendrons, they're all acid-loving plants. That's why you see them all over the place. But most vegetables don't like high acid in the soil, so you have to look at the pH balance. Now you can, and some people will recommend you do it, take a soil sample, send it into the state, get a pH balance thing, and they'll tell you what to do. Or you can just keep adding organic material to your soil, and eventually it will it'll work itself out. Because what they'll do is they'll tell you that you need to go buy this, 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 and this. Not brand name, but they'll tell you what the material is. Then you go out and buy it and dump it into your soil. All right. Again, let's go back to this, this, the almighty dollar. The idea of we growing your own food is one thing is to help save you some money on the, at the grocery store. If you're spending it all on this, it's kind of, kind of not worth the effort. It does taste better. Right at the poorhouse. After you spent all this money, to, so you, you weigh it. You've got to balance it out. So keep adding organic so material to your soil. Yeah. Is there a benefit to doing container gardening as opposed to? There's pros and cons to it. Um, I've, I've, I've done container gardening both. Um, raised beds, if you do a raised bed, that's a form of container gardening. It's essentially an outdoor container. There's benefits of easier access, less weeding, easier to control the watering situation. Um, you don't have to worry about, if it's, if it's gonna downpour some night, you can just pull your plants inside or under cover, under the eaves of the house or whatever, if you've got big you know, containers that can move, it's easier to control. The problem is you, have, you can you grow less. And certain plants don't do well in containers. Tomatoes do well in containers. Believe it or not, potatoes do extremely well in containers. Now, the container I'm talking about is a trash barrel with a trash bag in it full of dirt with potatoes in it. It will, grow, they, it will produce potatoes. You're not going to get the volume you would get in an open garden, but it's a whole lot less work. The problem with a container of any sort, whether it be uh, a raised bed or a pot of some sort or, or like a whiskey barrel or any of that stuff is that the soil will heat up quicker because right now if you were, were going to do a container garden type of thing 
I would start it right now outside. I definitely would start it out right on these nice warm days. And then at night, bring it in. And then in the morning, bring it out. And just keep doing that until you get to a point where you can leave it outside. Yeah, I would do it. If you have the place to put it. I know my wife would not be happy if I was dragging in trash barrels full of potatoes every night and every day and every night and every day. I'd be out there and the potatoes would be in the house. But if you can do that, great. I mean, cucumbers do well in a container. Squash will grow in a container. You just got to be prepared for that cascading menagerie. And you have to have the room. If, if you want to do it now, if you want to wait, you can just leave the pots outside. Yeah. I have neighbors that do it all the time. Yeah. I grew tomatoes in grow bags. Mm -hmm. And they did extremely well. And at the end of the season, I dumped out the soil, washed the bags, and they went flat for storage. And yeah. then you can just use them again. Yeah. All containers, if once the season is done and you dump them, you've got to clean them out. You have to. You have to wash out the inside and use a bleach or hydrogen peroxide to clean out the inside. Because it has, they'll have bacteria and dirt that will be stuck in, in on, that, on that remaining dirt that's inside. Because you don't know what you're going to plant in that pot. You might have had X plant here, and you didn't wash out the pot the proper way. And then you take Y plant this year and plant it in there. Well, come to find out, those two plants will infect each other. So... Just be careful, just wash out all the containers. On that line, you mentioned earlier that if you had potatoes in one place the next year, you wouldn't put tomatoes because something that the potatoes could have left behind. Yeah. Well, I planted potatoes in these big pots because mm -hmm. it's easy because you just dump them and there's all your yeah, potatoes exactly. and you harvest them. But now you just told me I dumped all that potato bad soil into my garden. So. It's spread out, though. It's not concentrated at this point in time. If you dumped it and you've raked it, you know, you, you've kind of just raked it out and it's done its thing, it's, that's, that's what it is. You just got to be careful not to... It is what it is. It's, am I saying, oh, my Lord, you're never going to grow tomatoes in that spot? No. Is there anything, like somebody told me once they dump hydrogen peroxide in their garden, and I'm like, is that why they might have done that, is to kill something? They, they probably did, but hydrogen peroxide dumped nearly willy in your garden, it has to be such a, 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 a low concentration. I mean, I mean it, it has to be a high hydrogen peroxide, low water, okay, for, it, for, for that to do any good. Because hydrogen peroxide, it, it does, the materials occur naturally in nature. They're, they are, they're, they're a sterile type of, of cleaner. But does it actually, will it actually do, depending on the concentration that you use? I keep the bugs. I had seen something for, if you have bugs in the house, if you water your plants with hydrogen peroxide, it won't kill the plant, but it'll mm -hmm. help get rid of the, the bugs. But the thing is, is we're talking about a house plant where you have a direct, as opposed to putting it on garden soil, it has to be a, such a large amount. They did it near their tomato plants. Okay, if, if they, if they concentrate it, you know, they you know, just do a certain spot, it's, pro it's probably for, for bugs coming up. But, uh, yeah, but, these, but this is stuff that you have to incorporate into your plant. But you, you raise beds, anything you can do outside, go for it. She, like she said, if you do it in a big barrel, but the potatoes, you just dump it, and it's, you got potatoes. So there's pros and cons to it. Well, the container gardens um, require more watering, too. Yes, and that's what I was saying, that, that, that soil dries out quicker. It heats up quicker. That means you have to water it more often. So it's very easy to drown plants. 
You can water them, to, you can love them to death, is basically what it is. You can over fertilize, you can under fertilize, you can over water, you can under water. The, the rule of thumb is stick your finger in the soil, and if it's dry, like to your knuckle, water. You, you're almost to the point of, of, of too, too little water. But if you can, if you stick it in and you're starting to get wet, <laughs> Back off. Don't let it drain. Let it let it dry out. Because tomatoes, for one, hate getting their feet wet. They hate it. They hate it. They hate it. That's why, like well, last year, my tomatoes didn't do that well because we got. I live up in Goffstown, and we just got drowned out. That we was raining and raining and raining and raining and raining. It never. The soil never really had a chance to dry out. So my tomatoes didn't do that well until the, towards the end of the season when we did get some fairly good dry spells. It was touch and go there for a long time. Planning also entails knowing which crops to plant when. There's such, there's such thing as cold weather crops and warm weather crops cold weather crops that do well if if it if it'll stay warm you could get away with planting peas right now if it stays warm and the soil would dry out just a little bit more other than that the seeds will rot in the ground but if it stays warm and we don't get rain for a, a like a week week and a half I'd plant peas radishes Spinach, lettuce, not chard. Um, a lot of your leafy veg, you know, the greens, but radishes will grow really well. Potatoes are a good idea to stick in the ground. You might be pushing it a little bit. Onions, root crops in the ground now. Because you, what you want is their, their green part of their plant the pop at the end of the last frost, before we get last frost. We get frost while that green part is up, you'll kill it. So you kinda, you gotta, you're kind of playing with time here. You just kind of, you're experimenting. But root crops are good, peas are okay. If you do things like potatoes, and turn up and, and things of that nature. And we've had this warm spell and they're growing good and the, the little green stuff starts popping up. And then all of a sudden they forecast we're gonna get one of those early spring deep freeze things. Take a, take a, a liter bottle, like the Pepsi bottle or a Coke bottle, cut it in half, stick it right on top of it. It'll act like a greenhouse. It'll protect it from getting frost. It'll protect the plant. And then leave it on there for a little bit. And you'll start to see it, the, the um, condensation from the soil coming up. And as it heats up, it actually will give like a shot in the arm to the, to the plant. You can just unscrew the top on it and let some of the hot air out. Screw it back down. It's like little greenhouses. Little mini greenhouses for each plant. That's if you push the envelope. If you usually work, you know, Memorial Day, you're not going to need to do that. But we have such a short growing season here in New Hampshire that you need to take every little advantage that you can get. And if that means pushing the envelope a little bit, I do it. It's a 50-50, it's a crapshoot. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. It's a packet of seeds I can replant. Everybody's asking me, why are we starting the tomato plants here so early? Because I, I, I grow, every year I, I start tomato plants. I got, some, I got some pepper plants growing down there too. But they, they ask me, they go, why are you doing that? I go, why not? They're going to they're gonna be so big. That's right. <clears throat> Come Memorial Day, they'll probably be ready to go in. They'll be ready to go in the ground. Is that pushing it for tomato plants? Yeah, it could be. 
Yeah, they like hot. But then you put that tomato, everybody know what I say, a tomato cage, right? You know what that is, that's that wire cage that goes over it. If for some reason you stick that tomato plant in the ground, you put the cage around it, everything's looking fine, and they weatherman says we are going to get an arctic blast, or it's going to be a, we're going to be below freezing tonight. Trash bags right over the top of that cage. You can do a paper bag. You can do anything. Just cover it. But it, it's easy peasy. Just stick a bag over it. Don't worry about it. So am I, it doesn't hurt. And everybody, I don't have grow lamps. Everybody goes, do you have grow lamps? No. I stick them in the window right over here at the, right by the circulation desk. They're doing fine. They're going to be needing to be transplanted pretty soon, but... But they're, they're doing fine. So basically, this is what you need to know before we get started. You, if, you, not, if nothing else, don't even bother with what my plan is over here. That, does, that's, that works for me, that whatever works for you. But take the time and think this out. Don't wake up one Saturday morning and go out willy-nilly and start saying, I'm going to have a garden and you just wipe out your whole yard and you plant all this stuff. You gotta have a plan. If you don't have a plan, it's not gonna work. Will something grow? Yeah, probably. But if you, if you know what's going, that way you can also know what works and what doesn't work for you. You know, note to self, don't do this one again. And, and, that's, how you, and that's how you learn to do it. These three things are definitely what you need. You need to know what you want to do before you even start. Don't get over exuberant and buy every seed packet there is at Home Depot. I've seen people go in there with this, like, oh, I want this, and I want this, and I want this, and I want, and I'm like, holy smoke, people, how big a yard do you have? What kind of plants do you want to plant? Do you want to plant flowers, food, combination of both, whatever, and how much room you have? Raised beds and containers will save you room. And they're perfect if you live in a, a complex or a subdivision that limits you on what you're growing and, what you can, and how you can grow it. Some people only have the, their balcony on their, on their condo or whatever to grow because the, the complex says, no, you can't. You can still grow stuff in containers and be perfectly fine. Well, that just goes really well. I, last year, I did, I did exactly what I'm doing here, and I gave each one of the employees a tomato plant last year. I said, just take them. One, one, of, the, one of my um, people that work on my team took a, a cherry tomato plant. The thing grew is the biggest tomato plant I have ever seen in my life. They live in a complex where they can't have shrubs out front because it destroys the aesthetic value of the complex or whatever. It was a tomato plant in a pot, but it, was, it looked like a shrub. She sent me a picture. It had grown like this mass and had tons of these cherry tomatoes all over it. And the more she picked, the more tomatoes came out. And this thing got bigger and bigger. And the, and the complex came over and they said, we had complaints that you've had a shrub out here. They went, it's a tomato plant, for God's sake. It's not a shrub. They had to move it off to the side someplace where it couldn't be seen. So it can be done. It does work. I, I have no idea what's going to happen with those. What do you do for water? Where? Like here with 20 by 40. So do you stand out there and with a hose? Nope. Or do you... Well, kind of, sort of. I actually have rain barrels set up on two corners of my house. So when it rains, and last year was a really bad time at certain, certain parts of the year where it didn't rain, but it collects in the barrels, and then I hook up a hose to the, those barrels, and I run it out to the garden, and I put it in through drip irrigation through the, through the hose. There's been times that I've used the hose, or I used to make my daughter carry the water in buckets. Now, we could have used the hose, 
But being the type of father that I am, I made her carry the water in buckets, just because I, I thought it was funny. But she would carry buckets of water to the garden and, and water each plant with the buckets of water instead of using the hose. It actually saves more water that way than using the hose. And you should water your plants from above anyway. You should water them at the roots. Right. You shouldn't? At the base. Yeah, because... The, with leaves, it'll, what will happen is if you, you, if you water at the base, it goes into the soil quicker. If you water from above, like rain, like you try to say, make it, make it rain, what happens is water gets stuck on the leaves. It will get absorbed. It will end up in the ground, and it will end up... But it also... Water droplets act like a window or a mirror, and they also they can generate heat, but they also can lead to mold and mildews and, and things like that, especially with tomato plants, which are susceptible to that. So you should always just water at the base of the plant. And it's a good practice for any plant, no matter what it is, is water the base. But um, mulching around each plant helps retain water, keep, so you don't have to water it as much. So you have your drip thing and then you put your mulch on top of it? No, you put the, you put the, the mulch, I, I put the mulch, I always mulch between the rows, that keeps the weeds out from there. Sometimes, depending on what it is, right around the tomato plants, I mulch around each one of the tomato plants. Drip edging goes, the drip watering hose goes right along the edge of the plants, so it'll snake in and out of those tomato plants, so it just waters that, the ground. Yeah. Yeah, so, and it'll soak in down through the mulch. But you can do the hose thing, you can do water buckets, water, watering cans. If you, if you have containers, you can get away with the watering can, just as easy. In fact, you can get on both, you can get all walk, just walk around it and get everything wet. Put them to work. I, I'm a firm believer in making them work. So, anybody have any questions, comments, something I didn't cover? Oh, yeah. Where do, do you, like, everybody says you have to buy these special seed heirloom seeds, whatever. Do you do that? I, I started out, one is I, I, I plant non-GMO which is gen genetically modified seeds, which means they're not been doctored in a lab. So you just buy seeds that say non-GMO. Yeah. I like the heirloom varieties because they're the older varieties. And those are the ones that come out with like the tomatoes that are all kind of funky and they get the bumps on them and they got them with like purples and greens and oranges and all this other. I think they look, they look cool. They don't come out perfectly round like you see in the grocery store. But the thing about those seeds are, is when the plant grows, when, say, you, say you buy an heirloom, non-GMO tomato plant, get the, you get the tomato, when you cut it open, save the seeds. Because those seeds, you now don't have to buy seeds again for next year. Yeah, I, did, I, I took some seeds from a spaghetti squash mm -hmm. and a butternut squash that I got at Market Basket. Mm -hmm. When I put those in the ground next year, mm -hmm. I got things I didn't recognize. Right. I couldn't even tell what they were supposed to be. Was it a pumpkin or was, I, I don't know what they were. That's, that's because it was, it's the plant, what happens is they probably, they are hybrids. Now if you, the, now the, the difference between a hybrid plant is it has two different parents, okay? It has, it's not like if you say, say a beefsteak tomato, and if it's non-GMO, non-hybrid, it's both parents were, were beefsteak tomatoes, the pol both pollinating plants, okay? A GMO plant is they take the, they take part of one and part of another and, com and combine it. It's gem genetically modified. A lot of your hybrids are GMOs or started out as GMOs. So you, if you replant those seeds, they may grow, they may not grow. It depends on the seed. If they do grow, you don't know what the, it's going to, it's going to take, it could take on the traits of one parent or it could take on the traits of another parent. I did that with a, for, just for example, I thought I was planting a zucchini that I had saved the seed from. 
Half of it came out yellow, half of it came out green, almost exactly. Because it was two different squashes, the, the genetic makeup of two different squashes. So it's going to revert, eventually it's going to revert back to its parents. And depending on how many times it's been bred and crossbred and crossbred and crossbred, the more you plant those seeds, you may come up with, you know, who knows what you're going to come out with. So that's one reason why I, I stay with heirloom and I stay with non-GMO and I save the seeds. And that's what I plant year after year after year after year is the seeds from the previous year's plants. I don't keep the seeds indefinitely because the seeds will go bad. I have, they say should be yearly. Beans will last ungodly amount of time. So will peas. Um, but your, your tomatoes, it's every, if you're going three years, you're pushing it. Yeah, three yeah, years is pushing it. But, but I have planted seeds that are five years old. And, they've, and, and some of them have germinated. Not all of them. So. You have to plant more because the germination rate goes down each year. Um, so, like you have squash. you have a variety of squash or just one kind of squash? That you I throw them all in there. I'll do butternut. They'll, butternut and like, and like spaghetti squash won't cross. Naturally, they won't cross. There, there are two different, like butternut, spaghetti squash, they won't cross. Okay. Butternut, pumpkin won't cross. Two different pumpkins will cross naturally. Um, summer squash and zucchini will cross naturally because they are related. They're both in the same family. Zucchini is just summer squash that... Zucchini actually was squash, squash, all squash originated here in the Americas. It was taken to Europe when, the, when we first got colonized and all this stuff. Somebody said, hey, I like a green squash. So they, they planted seeds that they brought over and one of them came out green or whatever. They said, okay, we like that one. So they kept replanting those seeds to form what we know as zucchini squash. But because they're genetically related to summer squash, they will cross very easily. And so you never know what you're going to get. But I will, cr I will plant zucchini, summer squash, butternut squash. I'll, I'll, I'll throw them all. Every now and then I'll throw a pumpkin in there just to see what the, to see what the heck happens. There's some that you're not supposed to plant near each other. You could probably just Google it. Yeah, you can look at it. We've got tons of books here on gardening and composting and everything else. But, you know, that's... So that's, you know... It's, what you want from seeds is up to you. But I like the idea that I can keep, I can buy them once. So instead of spending a buck ninety nine for a package of whatever seeds, and spending three dollars for a package of heirloom non GMO from a reputable dealer, I'll I'll buy the three bucks because that'll keep in in year year or two's time. I just made my money back. Yeah. Last summer I started for figs little saplings in pots mm -hmm. and I brought them in during the winter. Do I need to? Can I leave them out or will the New Hampshire winter uh, kill them? Okay. I would bring them in. I would. I, I would. Okay. Um, what I would do is just keep an eye. We don't know. Look how, look how funky this weather has been, you know? Um, it may come a time that you can feel comfortable in leaving it out. But who knows? I, if I was you, I would contact like the UNH Cooperative Extension um, and, and, and see what they say. They would probably have a better grasp on it. I mean, I've got, I've got a, what is it? I've got a grapefruit tree out in my yard. I just stuck it in the ground. It's growing. Last year, it produced fruit. Nothing I could eat, but I was like, Okay, New Hampshire, growing grapefruit. I have no clue. I have a friend that grows fig trees. I think sometimes they'll survive and sometimes they won't. Yeah, see, that's, that's why I'd ask experts in, more than me. Okay. Um, it depends if the variety is a hardy variety. Yeah, it you know, it, figs can survive a variety of different climates, but 
what would happen here. I don't want to tell you and then you come back and tell me I killed your fig tree. Yeah. Just one more question. Yeah. Can you describe what you do with potatoes in, uh, in trash cans a bit more? How big and oh, yeah. how you start them? You don't even have to have a trash can. You can even have a trash bag. Put enough, put your seed potatoes in there, cover it with dirt in a trash bag, like a, a dark trash bag. Roll down the sides. As they get bigger, they, you're going to put more dirt because they'll start, they'll start to pop out of the soil. You put more dirt and you roll the trash bag up. So eventually the trash bag's going to be full and you're going to have the dirt inside or in a, a large container. And you just want to, you don't want them, to, if they crown, and they start the top start to turn green, now you don't want that to happen. Because the green part of the tomato of the potato is poisonous. Oh, I see. All right. So you want that you want to just keep covering them. And when they and just like you would plant them out in your yard, when this it's gonna it's gonna send up a stalk, it's all gonna be green, it's gonna have leaves and all this other stuff on it, but it dies back. Once it turns brown and starts to die back, that's when you can harvest your potatoes. And you should have a bunch of potatoes in there. No, don't have, you can, I wouldn't too much though, you can just, they, they, you, can, you can leave it open for evaporation, you wouldn't, in a regular garden you don't put holes in it, you know, so I'm looking at evaporation, it's going to be enough soil in there, you don't overwater it, you don't pour five gallons of water in it, but you, you just play with it and see what happens, because once you puncture a like a plastic trash bag, it's going to start to tear. And that's the last thing you want to do. But you just don't want them to crown. You want to harvest them. Potatoes grown in a container are going to be smaller, generally, than potatoes planted out in a regular garden, just, just because of this, the being restrained into the container. But that's the only difference. Do you pile soil on top when you grow potatoes in the ground? Yes. You just plant them no, you, you, you plant them, you have furrows, you, you make furrows along, you plant your potatoes, you pile up, and then as they start to grow, you pile more. You, once they start putting the green, the, the, the stalk part, when they break, you bring soil, more soil in. As it gets up, you bring more soil in, because you don't want the root, which is the potato, to break the soil because it'll turn green in the sun, and that's what's poisonous. So you just keep piling it up. How deep a furrow do you start with? I would definitely read up on potatoes. Okay. Um, what I do doesn't, doesn't always pan out, but I usually go, I try to go about like six, seven, eight inches deep and start out that way. And I just dig out a furrow along the side, whatever I, it looks right to me. Did you do sweet potatoes the same way, or are those? Confused? I don't know. I've never grown sweet potatoes, so I can't answer that one. <laughs> well, they sell them as roots. Uh, or as plants usually. They have What's that? Sweet potatoes. Yeah, the same with potatoes. They they they. Yeah. They just are another root crop. Them. Um, I want to just change to the subject of uh, flowering bulbs. Okay. Um, I put a load in last year, not doing the research of what animals would eat <laughs> and I came home and they were all dug up and squirrels. Squirrels, chipmunks, um, you could, it could be skunks, skunks will do it. No, I put chicken wire down but that didn't help me last so is there anything else? Chip the little birds. Chip, um, chipmunks, I, I, gotta, I think it's, it's going to be squirrels or chipmunks. Yeah. If, if you put down chicken, it, how, how big are the squares on the chicken wire? It was just regular. Like, like that? Yeah. If, I, if a rodent, like a squirrel, chipmunk, mouse, anything like that, can get their head through it, you, you sunk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's, it's, like, it's like people who raise chickens, and they, they, they put a fence up, and they wonder how something got in there. Like fishers, weasels, things like that, if they can reach their paw through the hole, they will grab the chicken and pull it right back straight through that hole. Yeah, so I would replant your bulbs. I'd, I'd replant your bulbs um, and give it another shot and do what she said and try, try to do an offset layer of chicken wire. 
one layer on top of each other, but oh, the holes, okay. the holes so offset. Like right some hardware cloth. Hardware cloth, but the hardware cloth may be too small for the allow the plant to come up through it too. So, so yeah, the chipmunks will, will tear you up. Oh no, no, they just they found a smorgasbord. Yeah, it's a salad bar. Can you figure a way to keep the chipmunks out of the strawberries? Right? Oh yeah, I've tried painting the rocks red. Oh, I saw that. I didn't know if it worked. For about a day. And they figured out they were rocks. <laughs> so they, they got all my strawberries and left the rocks. So it, it is what it is. All right, guys, this is the end of the, the program. Uh, if, don't hesitate to have, if you have any questions, something's not going right, swing by the circulation desk, say, hey, can I ask you a question or whatever. We've got tons of books on gardening, on composting, on how to gardening here in New England, which is a whole different ball game than any place else. Um, and free, again, ask. There's a lot of resources out there. I'll help you find whatever you need. All right?